So it's a Friday evening, and to celebrate the end of the week, I am going surfing. And although I would argue that I'm always doing physics while I'm surfing, today I'm going to be sharing some of that with you. Whenever there are explosions in movies and the like, you see people sent flying by shockwaves. And in reality, that just doesn't happen. There was a really great episode of Mythbusters where they did exactly that. They had like a, like a jumping mannequin and then they set off some ampho behind him or something. And really, nothing changed. But there is a way to ride a shockwave, and hopefully I'm going to be demonstrating that in just a few minutes. Today's video is going to be a story about physics, about waves, and about reference frames. And exceeding Mach 1 on a surfboard, sort of. The first step in surfing is paddling out into the ocean so that you are where the waves are breaking. Actually riding a wave is much later in the process. Sometimes those waves that you're paddling through are nice and smooth and peaceful like this one, but sometimes they're more like a terrifying, rapidly advancing wall of water. In this particular case, while I was laughing at this guy, I was completely unaware that I myself was about to get hit with such a wave. <laughs> to understand what happens between paddling out and riding a wave, I'm going to take the physicist's approach and assume that everything is perfectly ideal, reducing the surfer on a wave to a sphere rolling down a ramp. Actually, let's get a ramp that looks just a bit more wave-like. There we go. So what can we do with a ball and a ramp? Well, we can roll the ball towards the ramp. Eliminating weird events like the ball getting stuck at the top of the ramp, there are really only two outcomes here. Either the ball makes it over the ramp, or it doesn't. If the ball is going to make it over the ramp, we can notice that it slows down a bit at the top and then speeds back up again while it's rolling down the other side. This is an exchange between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. In the second case, the starting energy of the ball isn't actually enough to reach the top of the hill. It expends all of its kinetic energy before it reaches the peak, and then it turns around and starts rolling back the way it came. Now in the intro I said I was going to start playing with reference frames. So wring out your brain and switch this up and assume that instead of the ball rolling towards the hill, we have the hill roll moving towards the ball. I guess they call them rolling hills, don't they? The two possible outcomes are actually exactly the same, just reference shifted. Either the hill goes straight underneath the ball, and the ball ends up not moving after all is said and done, or the ball gets sort of stuck on the front and travels along with the ramp as it goes. In both cases, only the relative velocity of the ball and ramp matter. If the ramp and the ball are moving towards each other very quickly, then they're likely just going to pass on by, you know, regardless of which one is stuck to the ground. But if the ramp and the ball are moving together in the same direction, their relative velocity is going to be lower, and the ball is more likely to get sort of stuck to the front of the ramp. This is why surfers paddle away from a wave that they're trying to catch. They're trying to decrease their velocity relative to the wave front, to the point where they get caught in front of the wave and can ride it in towards shore. Also, surfers that don't want to catch a wave will typically paddle towards the wave, straight into it, to increase their speed with respect to the wave front. In this clip, you can see surfers paddling in different directions as one wave goes through. Most of them are trying to skip the wave and they're paddling towards it, but one surfer paddling along with the wave catches it and starts riding. You do gain a lot of energy from a wave when you catch it. I mean, that's the point. You end up going fast. It's fun. But your final speed is limited by the speed of the wave. You cannot be accelerated by a wave to end up going faster than that wave that accelerated you. And your starting speed has a distinct lower limit. If you aren't going fast enough before the wave gets to you, then you won't catch it and you'll end up, you know, going the same speed you were before. So there's only sort of a range of energies that you can actually gain from any given passing wave. But that's not the entirety of surfing. That's like way down the list. It is time to discuss the elephant in the room. The fact that surfers on surfboards on waves are not perfect spheres on a solid ramp. I know, the physicist in me is just absolutely devastated. When you think about a ball on a solid ramp, the ball touches that ramp at exactly one location. 
and all of the force that ramp exerts on the ball, getting it to slow down and lifting it into the air, is exerted perpendicular or normal to the ramp surface. The interaction between solid objects is actually known as the normal force for this reason. The steeper the ramp, the faster the ball stops because the X component of the normal force goes up. When a surfboard is resting on a wave, the wave kind of squishes a little bit. So the flat surface that we care about is actually the bottom of the board. So when a surfer catches a wave, the entire surfboard has to tilt forwards in order for the wave to exert any forward force on the board. This can be dangerous though, because the board is a big flat sheet. And if you tip the front of that board down too far, you're gonna have a bad day. As soon as that front edge of the board enters the water, you have an additional force. The back of the board is still getting pushed up and forward, but now the front of the board is also getting pushed backwards and down with predictable results. In most of these board view clips of me catching waves, you can actually see me flailing my legs around in the back, trying to shift my weight and keep the board angled to collect as much energy from the wave as possible, while also not letting the tip of the board sink into the water. It's a little bit of a balancing act, but the penalty for being too far forward is a lot more violent than the penalty for being too far backwards on the board. Personally, I ride what is sort of a monstrously huge foam longboard, and unfortunately, that longboard maxes out on some days here at Sands Beach. The board is simply too long to catch really steep waves because it's always going to nose into the water. That said, there are some ways around this problem. In this clip of me catching what is a pretty tall wave for my board, you'll notice that I'm not actually holding the board perpendicular to the wave. I'm holding it at an angle. And that buys me a little more height to play with and allows me to redirect the energy that I'm gaining from the wave. This is all possible because surfboards have fins. The fins are additional flat surfaces that can exert forces on the water, and in return the water can exert more forces on the board, sideways. Also you can just sort of tilt the whole board and carve into the water and get an extra force component sideways by doing that, but it's a lot less obvious. When you have the board in a rotated position like this, there's a significant force exerted by the wave on the board towards the shore, but the fins on the surfboard like the keel on a boat, don't want the board to slide sideways. They don't want it moving laterally. And the water pushes against those fins, pushing the board with a restoring force to stop it from moving sideways. When you add these forces together, you see the board is accelerated nearly forwards at a pretty steep angle to the wave. If you want to gain more speed, you can turn the board perpendicular to the wave. And if you want to travel faster sideways, you can turn the board parallel to the wave. This footage is not of me. It's someone who's apparently very good at regulating their speed by weaving back and forth like this on a shortboard. Traveling faster sideways also becomes important to outrun the braking part of the wave. You can see that here. The wave right behind me is basically continuously braking, and I get to ride the steepest part. On the other hand, if I time this poorly and the wave breaks right in front of me or right behind me, that, that can end pretty badly. The real trick here is that the surfer's speed perpendicular to the wave is limited by the speed of the wave, but a surfer's speed parallel to the wave is unlimited. At this point, I've been showing you all these cartoons of these top-down views with, you know, forces labeled, but it'd be really nice if I could show you this physics actually from above a surfer. Unfortunately, my home-built quadcopter hasn't flown in four years. And I mean, the thing sounds like a flying lawnmower. I don't even like being near it when it's flying. So that most certainly will not work. It's like 40 degrees out here. I, uh, I stopped on the way before I even left my neighborhood to uh, put on my wetsuit all the way. Uh, yeah, I haven't been awake for a sunset in a long time. The only time that the wind dies down in Santa Barbara and you have big waves at the same time has to be like way early in the morning. So if I start yelling and sprinting towards the water holding this snorkel, 
Uh, start looking for the drone. Start looking for the drone. Oh yeah, this is a lot better than uh, than this. And behold, a surfer catching a wave from above. For safety reasons, even though this is a 250 gram drone, I'm not flying it directly over people. I'm always shooting at a bit of an angle. And I'm also only 100 feet up because of local airspace restrictions. So I ended up capturing this footage both diagonally and keystoned. Bottom line is that if we want to be able to analyze this footage accurately, I'm going to have to distort the image a little bit. Now we can watch the wave come in, accelerate the surfer, who immediately turns sideways and starts riding at an angle to the wave. The really cool thing is that if we trace all of these motions, we can measure the relative speed of the surfer and the wave just by the angle of this line. In this case, the surfer's path is making a 54 degree angle with the wavefront, and the tangent of 90 minus 54 is 0.73. That means that the surfer's average motion along the wave is about 73% as fast as the wave itself. And the surfer's total speed, the vector sum of these two components, is actually 1.24 times as fast as the wave. So the surfer is moving significantly faster than the wave that he's riding. I think that's pretty neat. If we take the time to track the surfer through this entire clip, we can actually plot out the course and speed of that surfer with respect to time. And you can see exactly how the surfer accelerates and then starts to trade energy back and forth between the parallel and perpendicular components. This whole video came about because I was surfing one day this summer and said something along the lines of, man, look at that guy on a shortboard going by at Mach 3. So I was joking at the time, using Mach as a figure of speech, meaning really fast, instead of the technical definition. But then I thought about it and I realized that surfer was actually traveling faster over water than a wave was traveling through water. And that was kind of neat. Ocean waves are not themselves shock waves and they're not created by an object that moves through water faster than they do. And the speed of a macroscopic ocean wave is orders of magnitude from the speed of sound in water. But still, it's a propagating wave. And I thought that the concept of outrunning a propagating wave in the same medium was pretty cool. That's when I first envisioned this overhead componented view of what was going on. And a few months later, here we go. Here's another clip of a different surfer. And in this case, he doesn't try to ride sideways as fast, but instead is actually steering back and forth, exchanging his speed between the X and Y components. It's pretty awesome to see these graphs do their complementary exchange thing like this. Maybe I just need to get out more, but I think it's really cool. Now that we've got this aerial view, I hope that the first half of the video clears up a bit too. When you want to catch a wave, you paddle away from it in order to decrease your relative velocity to the wave front. If you don't paddle fast enough, then the wave goes right underneath you, just like a ball rolling over a ramp. Once you're on the wave, you need to shift your body weight to keep gaining speed from the wave without dipping the nose of the board into the water. You want the force of the wave pushing you up and forwards, not down and spinning into a faceplant wipeout. Once riding the wave, you can stand up and use the board's fins and your body weight to carve into the water and change direction, accelerating sideways and actually traveling faster than the wave you're riding. Also, if you want to succeed where the Mythbusters failed and ride a shockwave from a bomb blast traveling at the speed of sound, maybe you should start by jumping out of an airplane at Mach 0.9, then wear a camera suit with Jimmy Buffett concert gear attached for control surfaces. I see absolutely no way for this to end badly. If you look closely for it, there is fascinating physics absolutely everywhere. Thanks for watching.